Soil is the source of sustenance for people and animals. For 241 years now, we've been saying that magic happens in the soil. Soil signifies stability and being down to earth, and we believe it can work wonders. To me, soil is something to be nurtured, sown and harvested year in and year out for many, many generations. It is the foundation of just about everything. To me, soil is one half of the new Lemkin podcast. As a farmer, soil is the basis of all my work. As a farmer, soil is the most important foundation for everything I do. Um, dirt? Sustenance. In my job, I move soil every day. In my job, soil is pretty much everything. It's literally the ground that we're standing on. Soil is the working section where our innovative Lemkin technology is used. Without soil, we wouldn't be able to exist. And that's why I see soil as a metaphor for life itself. This. Soil is the source of food for our animals. To me, soil means home. It's a challenge we have to face again every year. Soil means a lot of different things to me. To me, soil, like air and water, is the foundation of life. Soil is an important biosphere for animals, for agriculture, and it helps farmers in their work. Soil has always been the focal point of everything, for me, as well as for Lemkin, and it is essential to everything we do. Hello everyone, we would like to welcome you to the Lemkin Digital Event, where we will be focusing on soil. We are delighted that you've decided to join us in this blistering heat. Believe me, we're sitting in the same boat here. It's pretty warm here in the studio and the spotlights shining on us do not make it any cooler. So thank you once again for deciding to join us. That gives us the strength to go all out here as well. So, as you've already seen, soil is our focus today. And it has a lot of different meanings for a lot of different people. We've heard people speak of diversity, home, sustenance, and its role as a foundation of life. We want to tackle this topic from a wide variety of angles, and that is yet another reason why I'm so pleased to welcome this multifaceted group. My name is Helena Felixberger, and these are the people I will be talking with today. Standing next to me here is Christoffel Den Herder, Crop Cultivation Advisor at Series Horty Advice. Hello, Christoffel, it's nice to have you here. Good evening. And then on this side we have Joachim Pfanstiel-Wolf. He is Operations Manager for Lion Nesselrode GBR. Hello, Joachim. Good evening. And on this end, we have Simon Kempkin. He is an agro trainer and representative of Lemkin. Hello, Simon. Hello, and good evening. And naturally, we are also welcoming Andre Hahn, product management, also from Lemkin. Hello, Andre. Hello, everyone. We have another practitioner here with us online, Dr. Lars Fliege, Managing Director of Agrargesellschaft Pfiffelbach. Hello, Lars. Hello, Helena. So, how is it where you are? Is it hot there too? Yes, summery greetings from beautiful <laughs> Thuringia. Yes, it goes without saying that we want our content to shine today, but it may not be possible to avoid a sweaty brow or two in this heat. But I'm sure that you will be willing to overlook that. Yes, viewers, you have a part to play here as well. When we are finished, we will naturally be holding an extensive question and answer session. And with the amount of expertise we have gathered here, I hope you will feel free to ask any questions you might have. Simply use the chat function, and we hope that you have a lot to say. We're counting on you. I would like to launch our discussion straight away with a little introductory question that was also dealt with in our short video. Here's the first challenge for our panel. 
Please tell me, as succinctly as possible, what does soil mean to you? Christopher? To me, soil is always the foundation for successful cultivation and healthy crops. Simon, we heard your thoughts in the film, so that's why we're going to skip right past you and pass the ball over to Andre. From an agricultural standpoint, I view soil as capital. From a global standpoint, it is soil that ensures the world is fed. Mm -hmm. Joachim, what does soil mean to you? For us, soil is naturally also the foundation of the crops that we cultivate. And I believe that soil is such a complicated material that working with it requires all the finesse at our disposal. Finesse? Mm. All right. Lars, what does soil mean to you? Soil is life. It provides the foundation. It's where all plants grow. There's so much happening there, so much biodiversity. The soil is full of life, and we're called upon to retain all of it as well as to improve it. We have heard that soil is life. We can all agree on that. It is literally the ground on which we stand, and our experts from the literal field, our farmers, are naturally the ones whose daily work keeps them in closest touch with the soil. That is why we would appreciate it if you could tell us about your operations, and in particular, where you are located, what your crop rotation is, your crops, processes, machinery. Simply give us a brief introduction. Joachim, perhaps you could kick it off for us. All right then. As I said, I'm the operations manager for Lion Nesselwater GBR. We cultivate approximately 1,100 hectares in the Rhineland, running from Gravenbräuch right up to here to Alpen in seven locations. That requires a good deal of road travel. We deal with very different soils. They range from Leur soils with a soil rating of 80 to sandy soils with a rating of 30. As to what we cultivate, we deal with conventional cash crops, but we also do a lot with vegetables, especially carrots. Right now, I'm in charge of an operation with three permanent employees and two trainees, and in the autumn, we'll be adding seasonal staff for the vegetable harvest. In other words, you are very, very flexible, not only regarding the wide range of soils you cultivate, but also in terms of the sheer manpower and woman power you employ. Lars, what is the situation at your operation? Well, my company is called Pfiffelbach Agriculture, and we're located right in the green heart of Germany. We're a mixed farm and cultivate a total of 5,000 hectares. Arable farming is our biggest and most important activity, but we also have a very, very diverse crop rotation, which naturally is focused on corn. We store all our own crops ourselves. Here we can even see some pictures of our cleaning, drying and storage facilities. This is a picture of our sugar beet crop. Every year we cultivate 300 hectares of this. We also have other areas of activity, with our second most important being milk. Here we have a relatively new cow shed, which we built between 2017 and 2019, and here we can see 1,200 cows. Every month we are able to obtain 1 million kilograms of milk from our cows. We also have a piglet production operation. Every week our 1,600 sows produce some 1,000 piglets, which we then sell onto fattening farms. And finally, we also have an energy generation operation. We've hooked up a biogas system to the cow shed, and the yield, a full 500 kilowatts of electrical power, means that we are actually able to produce our own electricity and heating within the company. Thank you very much, Lars. Yes, I believe we've all spent some time outdoors at the, some point over the past few days, haven't we? And we have seen that spring is past and sowing has been completed. It is wonderful to see these beautiful germinating fields as, as we've done just now. And now I would like to hear from the actual practitioners. What have you done to prepare the soil for summer crops and root crops? When did you do the deep cultivation? In spring or in autumn? Lars, perhaps you could give your answer first. Gladly. We draw a fundamental distinction between cultivating the soil with a plow and doing so with a cultivator. 
The plow is used for almost all summer crops. That's because if we plow the fields and then leave them that way, they dry out significantly more quickly in the spring than they do if we leave them with a fine-grained layer. And rapid drying, more rapid soil heating, means that we're able to begin sowing earlier in the spring, and that means a better yield. In other words, the plow is a very important component. Approximately 50% of our fields are plowed every year. And the cultivator is the second instrument used for deep soil cultivation. We primarily deploy this in the autumn and in the summer for wheat and for rape. Then, when we don't really have all that much time available, the cultivator is an essential part of our philosophy, wherever it can be used. We're not eliminating the plow. We are trying to reduce its use. But the plow has a permanent role in our operation for cultivating the soil for summer crops. We simply prefer to use the cultivator for wheat and rapeseed. Joachim, what are things like where you are? Yes, I think we have the same differentiated approach here. It goes without saying that the cultivator, in our case, a good old torret, has a role to play. We use the cultivator, the torret, to prepare for catch crops. For corn as well, wherever it is possible. Whenever it is agronomically necessary, however, such as for barley propagation after corn, then it is necessary to get the plow back out. In the spring, we are more likely to use subsoilers, although we prefer carrots. In late spring, because they offer better moisture management with heavy rains and otherwise. So, you're still using a torrid. Just how old is it? They don't even make them anymore. Ah, uh, the torrid must be a good 16 years old now. And it's given us many years of good service. We're really fond of it too, because it is a four-bar model and leaves us with extremely level fields. We are right in the middle of the European Cup 2020, so that's why we're going to pass the ball directly to Simon. 16 years! 16 years. That really tells you something about the longevity and durability of our products. Not bad at all. Even so, there are now successor models for the Torit. The Torit was available in 3-bar and 4-bar models. The successor to the 3-bar Torit was, or rather is, the Karat 9, which is pretty much our universal cultivator for stubble cultivation, as well as for deep cultivation. We developed successors to the Torit because there were a few things about it that were no longer in keeping with the times. The design was a little bit old-fashioned, there was a need for higher release forces for the overload safety units, and naturally, we also wanted to have a traction booster so that we can really generate traction in the soil. More traction, or rather to do a better job of translating the force into forward motion in order to reduce slippage, something that is clearly beneficial to the soil health for the avoidance of smearing. At the same time, we naturally also wanted to provide the Karat with a quick change system, and I've brought a few things with me that are related to this. We are able to mount a variety of shares on the Karat according to the working depth, the working intensity, and the time. And it is all done without tools. That's because we use the same quick change system throughout. As a result, we can change all the shares quickly when switching fields during the season. For the first stubble tillage, for example, we might use the K8 share, as with this carbide version featuring angled carbide and equipped with blades, giving it a flat, uniform profile. For those who would prefer ultra-shallow cultivation, we are able to offer all of our customers with a Karat 9, this KG35 share. This would be for shallow cultivation, from 2 to 3 centimeters, and naturally, that also does a good job of conserving valuable groundwater. It also also preserves the carrying capacity because we are making a very shallow cut. Naturally, if you are using the cultivator instead of a plow, or as a supplement to a plow, we are able to equip the karat with a narrow share, a share that is 6 centimeters wide. With this, we can loosen soil at a depth of up to 30 centimeters. And, naturally, all of these shares boast the same quick change system. Now, if you are working with the torit as a 4-bar cultivator, like you are, then you would not go for the karat 9, but rather for the karat 12, which naturally has the same capabilities, including the track booster, but also has four bars and always maintains a narrow line distance of 23.4 centimeters and always maintains a high mixing intensity. That looks very good, Joachim. Hey, Christmas is going to get here eventually. Who knows, maybe Father Christmas will even put a four bar carrot 12 under your Christmas tree. <laughs> We can already see that both the cultivator and the plow 
are equally important. As Lars said earlier, 50% plow. In other words, the more possibilities, the better. Andre, could you please tell us a bit more about plows? Maybe delve a bit deeper into the field? <laughs> Yeah, plowing. Plowing is, of course, the epitome of conventional cultivation methods, and it's probably as old as agriculture itself. Even today, some of the same advantages that our ancestors valued in the plow continue to exist, and they're still extremely important. For example, and Lars already mentioned this, in places where the soil is really moist or wet and where it only warms up slowly, uh, these are places where the plow is used because it allows the ground to warm up more quickly. And as a result, sowing can be done more quickly and that improves the yield. But let's not fool ourselves. While this is an advantage in some regions, in others, such as those with very light sandy soil, this is naturally one of plowing's disadvantages because the plowing results in less efficient use of water and therefore in moisture loss. And here at Lemkin we have a solution to this problem and that is the combination of the plow with a furrow press system. Here, for example, we offer an integrated furrow press system, our flex pack. This is a furrow press that is permanently attached to the plow, entirely eliminating the burdensome task of transporting it to the field. Or you can opt to use a conventional furrow press from our company. These have the advantage, on the other hand, of not being integrated into the plow. As a result, they can be considerably heavier, and naturally they have a much greater pressing effect. By working in combination with the furrow press, it's clear that we're able to increase water efficiency while also combating soil erosion. Something that has changed, however, in comparison to conventional plowing, say, 20 or 30 years ago, is the fact that we're now able to do a better job of protecting the soil when plowing. We're able, for example, to equip our plows with the on-land version for on-land plowing. Oh, I think this is a good time to ask Andre if he would like to take a walk with me so that we can see this for ourselves on site. That is because we have a Jewel 8 MV waiting for us there, so that is where we are headed. Gladly. Thanks, Helena. Here we can see, just like Helena said, the Jewel 8 MV, an on-land version. The thing that sets the online version apart is its extremely long link, which is largely distinct from a standard furrow plow. This cylinder, which is located behind the link and can be continuously moved back and forth in the OF and furrow versions, makes it possible to turn the plow entirely around, leaving the body outside the tractor's external track width. This means that the tractor doesn't have to run along through the furrow, something that allows us to use larger tires. In the furrow, we can use tires with a maximum width of 710 millimeters. On land, we can use, for example, tires that are 900 millimeters wide, and their larger volume naturally means that they exert less pressure at the point of contact, resulting in less soil compaction. It also means that we don't have to drive in the furrow, but can drive on the land that hasn't been plowed. With the plow we have here, the Jewel 8 MV, we have an offset of 3.3 meters. That means that the maximum external width cannot exceed 3.3 meters until the edge of the tire is at the height of the furrow edge and then it collapses inward. That is what can be done with very wide tires. If, however, we want to work with larger plow structures with correspondingly larger tractors running in front, then our Jewel 10 and Diamond 16 each offer an offset of 4 meters. In other words, the tractor can be 4 meters wide and it is even possible to plow using dual wheel systems for an even higher level of soil protection. Very, very flexible, in other words. What sort of configuration options are there for shares, for instance? Yes, since we're talking about plows, particularly as they relate to the soil, we really allow you to choose a plow to suit your precise soil conditions. The primary characteristic of a plow is always its body, the body's shape. This unit boasts a CS40 moldboard. We have a total of 18 different plow body types with something for every type of condition. In fact, we have the largest range of body shapes available. And as a result, whenever we go visit a farming operation, and we can honestly say, yep, we have something for your conditions. And clearly, this variety goes beyond body types. We also offer a wide range of skimmers, for instance. We supply eight different skimmer shapes. These are joined by a wide range of different configuration options. There at the back, you can see a disc coulter for a clean furrow edge, for example. You can also attach a sword coulter. Here we have a turnover device with a hydraulic angular adjustment, as well as a wheel with a hydraulic depth adjustment. This means that every customer can configure their plow according to the requirements of their their own farm operation and the soils they're working with.
That is a lot of possibilities. So it's probably best to do a thorough consultation first and then simply select the best options. What then are some of the general arguments in favor of the plow? We've already mentioned a few of those. Perhaps you could touch on these things again for us? Let's get back to the topic of plowing. The key point here is the intrinsic principle by which the plow works. With the plow, we cultivate the soil by turning it over. This means the plow leaves us with a clean slate, so to speak. In other words, a surface that is free of organic material. As a result, when the field is sowed after plowing, the seeds can germinate undisturbed and emerge through the surface because they are not disrupted by organic material. This is a very important point. Another one is that the plow is a very effective machine when it comes to mechanical weed control. The potential hazards posed by the seeds of these weeds and the damage they can do are always lurking in the top few centimeters of soil. When plowing, these seeds are plowed under and moved to deeper soil regions where they're unable to do any more damage in the succeeding crop because they cannot germinate down there. Yes, and as my grandfather said long ago, the plow is simply the most effective machine when it comes to mechanical weed control. That statement remains true today, and it's a statement that will be true in the future too. There is no better mechanical solution for weed control, and the plow also offers other advantages that are related to the phytosanitary situation of plants. In other words, that are related to plant health. Here we're talking about crop residues from the previous year that had been infected with plant pathogens and were simply turned under in the furrow. Fungal blights, in other words. Fusarium, for example, is moved into a layer of soil where it cannot damage the successor crop. What is the situation with mice? Yes, that's also a very important topic. When it comes to animal pests, such as field mice, the plow also serves as a very good defense, because the plow buries the organic material that the feed mice feed on. As a result, these animals are no longer able to find any sustenance there, and they won't infest the furrow. In other words, plows are also a key factor when discussing the issue of herbicides, although herbicide is not necessarily the right term here. Andre has already talked to us about animal pests as well as fungi, so we should really be talking about chemical crop protection. You have to be very clear here, particularly now, when we as farmers are finding that more and more of the chemicals we use are being made unavailable. When it comes to combating weeds and animal pests and promoting healthy crops, all of these concerns are becoming more difficult to deal with chemically. And options here continue to dwindle. In my opinion, plows will have a very important role to play in agricultural systems when it comes to solving these problems in the future. So, let's take this subject, these chemical crop treatments, and put it before our panel. Absolutely. In the end, it's a problem we're all facing. So, of course, I would like to hear from our practitioners. What is the situation with chemical crop protection? I'm going to pass this question over to you, Lars. Yes, a great deal has been said here. Doing away with the plow here would be inconceivable. If we look ahead and work on the assumption that chemical crop protection options will continue to shrink, we will have to move towards more mechanical circulation of the soil, and not only to combat mice. That is because the plow can be a great help, not just here, but in combating other things as well. But it is not just plows that we need to be thinking of here. We must also consider mechanical hoes and harrows, and this always gives rise to the same problem, conflicting goals. On the one hand, we want to protect our climate and emit as little carbon dioxide as possible. On the other hand, we want to talk about reducing the use of chemical crop protection agents and doing more to mechanically turn the soil. In other words, we must answer the question, is it really better to do more and more work with the crops, such as corn, and take two passes with a harrow, and maybe even hoe it once or twice, than it would be to cover the area once or twice applying crop protection chemicals. When it comes to climate protection, this is a relevant issue, and it's one that has to be addressed, including with regard to species conservation. After all, I can't really imagine that a skylark would appreciate it if I drove a harrow through its nest twice every spring, instead of passing once overhead while spraying crop protection chemicals. In other words, we need to take our blinders off and look at the whole thing a bit more holistically, perhaps, and properly weigh up the benefits and the damages and take a somewhat broader view of the situation. Joachim, how do you feel about chemical crop protection and mechanical crop protection? 
Yes, we also differentiate here. Right now, we are still able to make use of glyphosate for beet cultivation to spray the catch crops. As long as this is still allowed, we will be all right. But when it comes to vegetables, French beans and soya beans, we have already reached a point where we don't have any chemical agents that we can use for post-emergence. That is when we need the hoe, and we will have to be doing more with this, although my generation was already doing that 40 years ago. We even have a saying here that you have to hoe the sugar into the beets. We will have to do even more with this, but we will be doing so with the best technology that is available today. Do you mean that it will require more hands-on labor? No, what I meant, well yes, actually, we will need more time working in the field, but instead of a person sitting on the hoe in the back, surrounded by clouds of dust, we will have a camera that does the job for us. I doubt that anyone will have anything against this solution. No, I don't think so either. So, we are talking about a comeback for some very old methods, but done in an entirely new way. Christoffel? Chemical crop protection, mechanical crop protection. Yes. What is your opinion? Well, I'm a biological cultivation consultant for vegetable cultivation. And hoeing is naturally a very widespread process here. And as you just said, it is no longer done the way our grandfathers did it. Today, we're talking about a very modern, a very modern technology with camera control and a high level of precision. And in recent years, we have been really making progress regarding the area we can cover, because these machines are simply getting wider. I still remember how two or three years ago, how shocked I was that Steckety had built this huge hoeing machine for France. It was 24 meters wide. And it's easy to see how, working with a machine like that, you could really do well in agriculture when it comes to area covered and effectiveness. The same thing applies to Harrow technology. So this is really a highly relevant topic today. More and more, one notices conventional farmers showing an interest in this issue because the controversy surrounding herbicides has made it clear that their use will be restricted in the future. Restrictions are increasing. Our options are diminishing, yes, but on the other hand, I believe that there are still possibilities here as well and these will continue to develop. Otherwise, it's not just hoeing techniques that can be used, but naturally also plowing, seedbed cultivation, sowing technology, all these things can help with weed control. Mm -hmm. Good, good. Then we've laid the groundwork, so to speak. We're talking about seed bread preparation, correct? Yes, exactly. Exactly. And I'd like to pass the ball right back to you, Lars. Seed bed preparation. How is that done at your operation? For our seedbed preparation, we primarily rely on the Compactor, an excellent machine produced by Lemkin. In our image video, we were able to see a new 12-meter model, which creates an even leveler seedbed than the 10-meter machine, because the segments are simply that much wider. Doing seedbed preparation with the Compactor is a perfect fit for our soil. Naturally, it is necessary to take a differentiated approach here, too. If the soil is too heavy, it won't work all that well. But if you have a good mix between loamy and clayey soils, then the compactor does an outstanding job. It leaves you with a very finely crumbled, well-reconsolidated seed bed. You can go from a raw furrow directly to a seed bed in one step. This is excellent for conserving water. It's really quite amazing. That is the sound of someone who is extremely satisfied, and that makes all of us happy. Joachim, how do you approach seed bed preparation? As I mentioned earlier, we use the torrent when cultivating the soil for sugar beet before our catch crops. Then, in the spring, the first thing we do is to work the soil and its frozen catch crop with the Reuben, shortly before sowing, so that the catch crop is somewhat crumblier. And, most importantly, to ensure that the mulch seeding can gas off. Then, a short time later, we do what Lars does, just on a somewhat smaller scale, with our compactor. And I would also say that this machine does a good job of conserving water for the spring.
Very, very good. Now, we've heard about all sorts of different machines, including the torit, and what you might call its successor, the carrot, the ruben, the compactor, all part of a system, with everything working well together. I would say, well, we have a ruben right there. Simon, the specialist, he's right there. It would be much better if we were also right there. So, why don't we do that? Okay. Gladly. The Rubin 10 is the successor to the Rubin 9, of which we sold nearly 22,000 machines over a period of 20 years. That is obviously a huge success for Lemkin, and with the Rubin 10 we've tried to build on the success and to make our disc harrow even better. What we're seeing here is the straw harrow. Is that a standard piece of equipment? No, the straw harrow is optional, because you can, of course, use our Rubin 10 both for the cultivation of catch crops and stubble. The downside of disc harrows, which is inherent to the system, is that they have a smaller pull effect along the surface. So harvest residues or piles of straw that sometimes remain across the area you are working on are not evenly distributed and mixed into the soil. You can easily detect where that has happened as your catch crop will emerge uneven. Evenly. When you see that, you know the soil hasn't been properly prepared, the straw wasn't evenly distributed. So we thought about how this can be resolved, about how to improve the results. That's where the optional straw harrow comes in, which can be adjusted without tools so there is no need for the user to do anything to it. It will extend across the surface as you work and automatically retract when you reach the headland so you have a narrow turning circle. The straw harrow is pretensioned. When the arm extends, the straw harrow is pretensioned. If your implement is pulled Pulling along a large amount of straw, which needs to be evenly distributed across the surface, and the pressure exceeds the preset level, the straw harrow opens gradually, releasing the straw that is accumulated in front into the disc harrow behind it, bit by bit, so that the discs can work on it and cover evenly with soil to ensure a fast rotting process. So very gradually, very evenly… Yes, exactly. So how do you ensure a consistent working depth? We have included a number of components in the disc harrow that make sure that it runs runs evenly across the area you are working on, even at higher forward speeds or when driving diagonally to the surface, and that it doesn't start rocking. This touch wheel here is one of these components. Again, we made sure that the touch wheel is user-friendly. The user doesn't need to take any specific action, even when changing the working mode. The touch wheel will always keep the unit in balance, even when you cross a tram line or combine harvest track. No matter what, the touch wheel will balance out the vibrations, so that keeps the working depth at a consistent shallow level. Keep going? Mm -hmm. yeah. Maybe you can just take us around. You follow me. I'll talk, and if you have any questions, just ask, okay? Perfect. <laughs> so, let's look at the discs. We've come up with something special here, too. The discs are arranged in a symmetrical layout. The discs on the left and the right-hand side have the same build so that the disc harrow follows the tractor without side draft. This way, we minimize passover of the working area as we can always utilize the full width of the implement. And we don't need to reduce our working width as a consequence of the overlap necessitated by swings. The discs themselves are arranged with an undergrip and diagonally to the direction of travel so that we can cultivate the stubble when the time is right. Even if the soil is hard or dry, the diagonal arrangement and undergrip of the discs ensure excellent penetration, so that the farmer can cultivate the stubble on the date that they determine when they want to. Good stubble cultivation is one of the prerequisites for a good yield. If you look at the tine on this side here, you can see that its design is curved towards the bottom, that it drops slightly. That makes sense in terms of field health, because it prevents soil or plant residues remaining on top of it. They naturally fall down, so so that you don't end up taking them from one field to the next or end up with a large amount of soil piled up on top of your device at the end of the working day, causing extra effort for taking it down again. And while we're here, let's take a look at the overload protection unit. Every disc has a spring-coiled overload protection unit. Each disc is mounted individually, so that even in the event that we hit an obstacle, only a single disc will deflect upwards, and we can carry on working at the same working depth with all the others. The discs are preloaded with 200 190 kilograms each. 
but there's no need to worry about causing extra stress on the material because when the safety mechanism has tripped a disc, it will recoil downwards before returning to its regular working position, releasing the energy that builds up into the soil rather than putting extra stress on the frame. After all, we don't only want our torit to last for at least 16 years, we also want our Rubin 10 to last for more than 16 years. Yes, absolutely. That's what we're hoping for. But let's carry on. The impact tarot. The impact tarot is arranged centrally between the discs, and that's something only Lemkin has. It's optional equipment, but it offers a whole range of advantages, because what we're after is a good result, an even mixing effect. So this is what the process looks like. The first row of discs throws the soil upwards. It hits the impact harrow, which pre-crumbles the soil and distributes the crop residues in the direction of travel, and then it all drops down. The second row of discs processes the whole thing again, further cutting up crop residues, mixing and crumbling the soil once over, so that we achieve a better intensity of mixing and a more even crumbling, which in turn ensures better germination and even rotting. Plus, it's also available as a comfort version for easier adjusting, so you can be sure to always have the perfect settings with reduced effort for making the adjustments. So moving towards the back here, we were talking about the stable position of the unit even when driving with high forward speeds. What we see here is that both the lateral parts or segments of the machine are freely suspended. We opted for a hydraulic solution for this. The effect is that the lateral parts can adapt to the contour of the working surface. This way, the whole disc harrow will always remain in a stable position. Then, if we continue here, we see that there's another harrow. This one is called a leveling harrow and is a standard piece of equipment. It serves to evenly distribute the soil across the working width before it runs onto the wheat field. It gives us an even horizon without waves or bumps in our field, and that's what the leveling harrow with the same settings is used for. And of course, for mixing and crumbling. So what's special about the roller? Okay, this, last but not least, is the roller. It's a double profile roller. The special feature of the double profile roller is that the soil settles into the profile here. So it reconsolidates the soil, but prevents compacted layers in the field that you sometimes end up with when using closed rollers or other rollers. Again, the roller has a high load bearing capacity and runs smoothly, not least because the roller is also freely suspended. So, in the direction of travel, vibrations are absorbed and the unit just runs completely smoothly. Are any other types of rollers available? We have a whole range of rollers, so that there is one to suit every need, depending on the soil, depending on the intensity of work, depending on the desired working depth, so that you have the right roller to reconsolidate the right amount of soil and optimize the ground, whether you're working at deep or shallow depths. Well, Simon, thank you very much for showing us around the Rubin. We had already heard that Joachim, for instance, uses the Rubin and the compactor as a system. And as we can see that there's a compactor right over there, and here's Christoffel. So, let's seize the opportunity to learn a bit more about the compactor. We'll start with the roller, Christoffel. So, what can you tell us about this roller? Well, let's just walk down the whole machine. To me, and for many of our customers, the compactor is the basis for efficient weed control in spring, apart from preparing the seed bed. What really works quite well with the compactor is preparing a stale seed bed. And because it operates at a very shallow level, you can keep cultivating and germinating the same flat layer again and again. If you do that a couple of times, it will start sprouting a few times, and then you can prepare the actual seed bed. But why does the compactor run so flat? The reason is here. If you look, you'll see that it has two rollers. So you have a two-bar roller here, which is in charge of the initial crumbling, then you have this bar, which retains the soil. Actually, these two parts together crumble the soil. Jointly achieving finer crumbling. Exactly. The larger, heavier chunks go on top, the fine soil underneath. Another job the compactor does well, and I have to say it's an important aspect of weed control, is that it planes the subsoil like a carpenter's plane. That's something other machines can't really do. So once you've leveled out the subsoil, you can be certain that your weeder and the seeding machine will run extremely consistently. 
What different types of shares are available? You just released one really effortlessly. Perhaps you can tell us a bit more about that? Yes, of course. Now, what's important to note is that this is a proper Ho share. It's flat. Most shares have a sharp tip to help them penetrate the soil. This one works across the whole surface with good overlap so that the weeds are cut down properly with every pass. That's really important to prevent any larger weeds from continuing to grow. So here's how it works. Additionally, there's the crumbling roller, or tube bar roller and bar, and these provide for additional leveling. Again, they run very smoothly thanks to these two rollers. And finally, of course, the complete surface is reconsolidated so that the moisture can be retained. And it's designed in such a way that the coarser soil comes to lie on top of the seedbed so that you minimize erosion. So it's a fantastic machine for optimum soil preparation. For sowing, but also for weed control, and that's really important. Yes, it's versatile and does an important job. So we've mentioned that, and Christoffel also has pointed it out, but now let's move on to the sowing process and back to our panel. Thank you, Christoffel. So, we've now prepared the soil, and it's time to sow. Joachim, what can you tell us about that? Well, I've already talked about spring sowing. We have a couple of popular trailed implements for preparing the seedbed and for sowing, in order to make the best use of the soil's easier breakability in spring. In autumn, though, that's a completely different matter. Lars will probably be telling me that our approach is far too expensive, but bear in mind that wheat is sown well into autumn, until December even. And that's what we need the power harrow for, in order to react to changing conditions of the soil and changing conditions for sowing. Lars, do you use power harrows too? <laughs> well, we used to, but we eventually gave up working with actively powered tillage machinery and we've switched to passive devices. What's important to us is the high power of impact and good timing for our sowing. We've stopped using power harrows, we can't afford that. But Joachim, there is no one-size-fits-all solution. Yes, it depends. Exactly. For your business, the power harrow will certainly be a perfect, indispensable solution, but for ours it's not. Yes, that's just how it goes. There's no universal solution for everyone, and that's why we have this varied portfolio and appreciate the variety. Christoffel, you also do a lot of testing. Maybe we can have your take on this? Yes, on sewing technology. I test a lot of machines, sometimes comparing different models, and I've done several tests on sewing technologies in recent years. What we realized was that double discs, for instance, are extremely important to achieve good soil penetration and a uniform placement depth, even with parallel operation. So you're left with beautifully prepared soil but it also enables you to cut into it to ensure a uniform depth. This kind of thing is really important for your crops to grow evenly and for a successful harvest. Thank you a lot for that. So, we have learned quite a bit. To summarize briefly, the question was, which tillage strategy is ideal for ensuring that your soil is healthy and produces good yields? As Lars mentioned, there is no standard one-size-fits-all recipe. I think that's one thing that became very clear in this discussion. So, if you will allow me to conclude, there are countless factors that need to be taken into account. In other words, you need to know your own soil and do what's best for it. You have to educate yourself, take advice, and then decide on the right tillage strategy, using the right equipment at the right time. And then you are on the best terms with your own soil. In other words, we've come full circle. This makes it really, really clear why Lemkin puts the soil at the center of everything. But now, the floor is yours, and we're putting your questions at the center. I'm sure that you've been raising questions eagerly all the time, despite the sweltering heat. So, before I open the round of questions for all of you, 
I have one final question I'd like to ask everyone in this panel. And again, the challenge is to keep your answers short and simple. What would you wish for your future and your soil? Andre? Great question. The first thing I would wish for my soil would be that it doesn't have to suffer from thirst as much over the next few years as it did in recent drought years. I think that would really make all our lives easier. The other thing I would wish for would be that our soil is cultivated by our intelligent farmers using smart, appropriate cultivation strategies that keep it in the good shape that it's currently in, in most of our regions. Then I'll pass the question on to Simon. Well, I can only support what Andre is saying. Andre, you are absolutely right. We know that our farmers treat their soils well and take good care of them, but what I would wish for would be that everyone treated the soil with the same care and respect. Ah, uh, so you mean that each of us should do their part. You are right, soil protection concerns everyone. Thank you. Christoffel? Yeah, actually, I would wish for the soil to be even better tomorrow than it is today. And for a system that makes a contribution that helps bring this about. Yeah, we can all back you up on that one. Joachim, what would you wish for your soil? I would wish for my soil that we keep finding good solutions to address any future problems, climate change and so on. So, in this context, my wish is that Lemkin keeps developing innovative products to help tackle all these issues. Thank you. Lars, will you give us a final word for our panel? Then it's your turn. I would also wish for policymakers to continue to let us treat our soils the way we deem fit. At the end of the day, we are the true environmentalists. We are the pros when it comes to soils, and we know what's best for them. Thank you very much to everyone on the panel for this fruitful discussion, I think that's safe to say. And thanks in particular for answering the many questions. I just had to read them. Thank you too for asking more questions. We'll get straight to yours now. Wow, that's quite a few. So, I guess this one relates to the Rubin 10. Simon, you said the di disc consolidates the soil with a downward pressure of 290 kilograms? Yes, let me put it this way. The coil spring is preloaded with 290 kilograms. You can't achieve that with a rubber stop. The idea is that the disc remains in its working position for as long as possible so that the farmer can stay in the desired working depth for as long as possible, okay? So that the working depth is consistent. Okay, great. So, I hope that's become clear. So, next question. It's another one for you. What happens when there's a large amount of organic mass in the middle segment with regard to the X-shaped layout and the even working depth? X-shaped layout? Uh, the layout. It's about achieving a uniform working depth. It's hot, isn't it? Well, the discs are arranged symmetrically to ensure that you can work without a side draft. Organic mass runs through the disc harrow without any problems. The line distance is big enough, the distance between the discs is big enough, it's all distributed evenly. Next, is there a trend towards on-land plowing? I would pass that one on to you, Andre. Yes, definitely. Take the Joule 10, for instance, our largest series of mounted plows. Almost a quarter of those were equipped as on-land versions last year. And even among the Diamond series, about a third of all plows are on-land versions. The share has increased substantially over recent years, and it's showing that farmers are increasingly accepting of on-land plowing. So it's definitely a trend. Yes. The next question is, can I prepare a stale seed bed using my power harrow? Christoffel, would that work? I can answer that quite clearly, no. The problem with the power harrow is that it doesn't cut the weeds. It will cover them with a bit of soil, but the results are disappointing every time. So you should absolutely use a hoe share, definitely. Okay. No question about it. So, if that's what you're doing, you should stop it and do it differently. How deep do you drive the plow in the three regions from which our practitioners and experts come? Well, Lars, let's hear from you first. How deep do you go? 
Well, it varies. It depends. On a really ruddy piece of sugar beet land, we may have to go as deep as 30 centimeters. But we normally only plow to about 25 or 28 centimeters in the autumn furrow. Mm -hmm. Joachim, uh, from what depth to what depth? I would agree to what Lars said. It always depends on the conditions. It's the same with us. If the sugar beet harvester has done a bad job or has had to work under unfavorable conditions, then we need the plow to bring dry soil up. But that's all. We don't need to use the plow for deep plowing. Okay. Christoffel, you do a lot of testing. How deep? I have to say that the trend in practice is for increasingly shallow depths. We used to plow easily to 30 centimeters, but in the meantime, many farmers only go as deep as 20, 22 to 25. Okay, so plowing is increasingly shallow. To be gentler on soil life, yes. Yeah, clearly. That makes sense. So how shallow can we manage? Yeah, Helena, that's an interesting question. I realize from the reactions in this round that it may be a good idea to point out the range that we have. So mainly working depths range between 25 and 30 centimeters. But shallower plowing is, of course, also a means of saving water, something that was particularly important in the past three years, which were extremely dry. Accordingly, we offer our clients options such as the W52, for example. Its body shape is extremely coiled, which means it turns the soil reliably even when working at shallow depths. And you can use this body form from, let's say, a working depth of 15 centimeters. But equally, you can equip our plows so that you can plow very deeply. Especially as we get closer to Italy, very deep plowing is more common. We can even supply a plow with a larger frame height, allowing to plow as deeply as, say, 40 centimeters. So it's really up to you. It's quite flexible in terms of how shallow or deep you want to go. Let's see. Your questions are passed on to an editorial team who filter out the duplicates and sort them a bit. But I think we've responded to the main ones. Any other questions we receive, we can answer after the event. It is incredibly warm today and we're all really hot. So thank you to you all. Thanks for being interested and for your attention. Special thanks to you, of course, Andre, Joachim, Joachim, Lars, Christoffel, and Simon. We hope that you'll be able to join us again next time. Until then, please stay safe and stay grounded. Ciao.